Okay, Second Samuel. Been going through David's life, and a couple weeks ago we started on David's tragic relationship with his son Absalom. And didn't really um, get much into lessons that we could learn from that. We just kind of went over the story. And uh, just as a recap, Absalom um, is David's beautiful son. It's so strange to think about Absalom sometimes. It's like, what? I, I don't get it. I don't get what possesses men to want long hair. It's like strange. But anyway, this guy had what? Do I dare ask? No, I don't think I couldn't. I couldn't. It would it would just it would just come out on the sides. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing on top. <laughs> you ever see one of them guys that's like bald on top and hair's long on the sides? It's like, buddy, come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah. The mower went right down the middle. Oh, man. No, I couldn't. <laughs> Losing it all. Oh, man. But uh, so Absalom, Absalom had his hair that he had to cut every year because it's, it's like he had to cut it every year because it bothered him. If, if it didn't, he'd let it keep, keep growing, you know. But the Bible says that every year he cut it, and it was, we said, uh, about five to six pounds of hair every year. I don't, I don't know what, nor, I mean, my haircuts would be like an ounce or two. But, you know, what like a, I don't know what a normal haircut would be, but I would guess it would be well under a pound of hair for the normal person. And uh, he was quite abnormal. And, but he was apparently a likable guy. And he he had to be likable because they still liked him after what he did, how he acted. And but his brother Amnon uh, has uh, immoral feelings towards his half sister Tamar, and ends up uh, committing uh, wicked sin with her, and. And Absalom hates him so much that he, he kills him. He kills his brother and flees after that. And so uh, there's this, we, we said, yeah, so you have Amnon's crime against his sister. You have David's angry about it, but doesn't do anything. The Bible never records that David does anything about this. He never confronts Absalom, never deals with the sin, um, never deals with the problem. And so Absalom... Uh, Flees. He, he's, he's, you know, he just he, you know, he kills his brother, and then he he, he flees, um, and then he. he where, does anybody remember where he fled to? I need a point here. Where Absalom flees to after he kills his brother Amnon, his father-in-law, uh, in uh, Gesher, and. Probably, I mean that the Bible doesn't spell it out, but I mean this is this is not a God worshiping land. Uh, most likely, a heathen father in law, and David just one of those situations. David probably should have never married this woman, um, of course, for several reasons. Because, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. polygamy in the Bible is like make you scratch your head, but any ball well, polygamy period, but. In the Bible, uh, the Lord just seems to, it's a good thing the Lord is merciful because, anyway, we're all wicked sinners. But, uh, so David has more than one wife. This uh, woman, Absalom's mother, is one of them. Absalom's grandfather is a king. Absalom flees there into Gesher. And so he's there for how long? I remember. think it was three. And then when David calls him back, um, he's in Israel for two years before David sees him. 
And so David comes, or Absalom comes back. David is convinced by Joab to bring Absalom home and, you know, deal with this. And so Absalom is sent for, he comes home and sits in his house like David never, his father never sees him. His father never uh, deals with this issue. And this could not have sat well with Absalom. I mean, he's, in fact, he, he wants to... <sighs> He wants to see his father. He wants to uh, find out what's going on here so much that he burns down Joab's field because Joab doesn't respond to him. And so he says, hey, uh, go light Joab's field on fire. That'll get his attention. And so Joab comes, you know, all enraged. And he says, I sent for you, and he didn't listen. So he says, get me before King David. Why, why am I here? Why, I could have stayed in Gesher. It was like, he brought me back, but doesn't want to see me? What's the problem? And so I think probably during this time, it didn't do Absalom any good. He's probably uh, growing uh, a little uh, bitter against his father. And so David, we saw some mistakes, okay? David, Am he's, he's angry at Amnon, but he fails to punish him. Uh, he mourns and longs for Absalom, but he fails to go to him. There's this uh, half-hearted forgiveness there when he brings him back. He sends for him, but he fails to meet with them. Uh, he fails to discipline him. I mean, it's just like, it's just, it's just this tragic uh, relationship. It's really an odd one. Um, and But we see that Absalom isn't innocent in this situation either. Because Absalom plots revenge after seeing what Amnon does to Tamar. He plots revenge instead of uh, appealing to proper authorities. He orchestrates his brother's murder instead of, uh, you know, allowing his father to potentially deal with it, or um, which I, I guess he gave his dad time. Uh, the Bible says it was, I believe, a year after, a uh, year or two years. I'm going to get all mixed up here. Two, three, one. It was... I can't remember exactly, but there was some time given. Absalom gives his father time to take care of this issue, but he still shouldn't have taken the law into his own hands. Uh, but he does, and then he flees instead of facing his father and, and, and dealing with this problem. He, he nurses bitterness instead of uh, just just letting things go. We said he, he even names his daughter Tamar. It's like he couldn't let this problem go in his mind. And yes, what Amnon did was wicked, but uh, Absalom just let it bother him so much. <clears throat> he uh, returns to Israel and fails to repent. He uh, Eventually, he undermines the king's authority. He wants to take over his father's kingdom. He uh, is deceitful. I mean, he's just, he's not a good guy. He's deceitful. He wins over the hearts of the people of Israel, uh, convincing them that if he was in charge, then all their problems would be taken care of. He's just a very uh, deceptive young man. He rebels against the king, and we know that he pays the price for his rebellion. So some lessons in this life of, of Absalom uh, and this relationship between he and David, uh, mainly from Absalom's life. What can we learn from Absalom, Absalom's life? All right. Uh, <sighs> And again, we're not going to read a lot here because we, we did a lot of reading a couple weeks ago on this story. Um, but what can we learn from Absalom's life? Well, first we need to realize that leadership sometimes fails. And I think this is important for all of us to understand, but especially children uh, growing up. Your parents aren't perfect. Your pastor isn't perfect. Your teachers are not perfect. And they're going to make mistakes. Now, it's not our job uh, to nitpick and say, well, if I was in position, I would have done that differently. Or as a kid, you know, to, to look at your parents and say, you know, well, that was a stupid decision. I was there. I saw what, you know, my sister did to my brother, and that is not the correct decision to be made. Well, Maybe your parents didn't see everything. Maybe, like, just it's not time to, you know, take matters into your own hand. Realize that leadership sometimes fails. And we're talking godly leadership even. 
men and women who desire to follow the Lord, men and women who are uh, students of God's word, um, they're just going to fail because we're humans. Now, there's a fine line between uh, making a bad decision or two uh, and living in sin. Um, I'm not, I'm, don't, don't get that I'm condoning that we, we put up with the sins of leadership. I mean, the Bible talks about, especially pastors uh, in Timothy, that we are to uh, rebe- the, the, what is how's it? Let's, let's turn over there. Um, got it written down here. First Timothy 5. It's the sin rebuke before all. First Timothy 5. Seventeen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. So it's in the context of, of pastors and um now again, this is not this is not teaching that the church needs to nitpick their pastor's life. I mean, just I mean, there are congregations that do that, and they go through you know pastor after pastor after pastor because you know no pastor is perfect and good enough for us, and that's not the right mentality either. But the pro- the thing is that there are sins that need to be dealt with when they are committed by a person in in leadership, and so I'm not we're not condoning the allowance of sin in a in a leadership position you know open flagrant sin but at the same time just understand that leadership is not perfect and they're going to make some not so good judgments sometimes and they're going to fail no one is excusing it it's just it's a fact of life and it's not my job to step into every leadership position that I see, you know, I'll step in and say, well, President Biden, he made a stupid decision here and I need to take matters into my own hands. Or, you know, my pastor, I don't agree with that decision he made. And, you know, my parents, they did this. And, you know, just, just understand that they're not perfect. All right. Leadership's going to fail. And in, uh, along with that, sometimes life isn't fair. You know, sometimes there's a wrong that seemingly goes unpunished. Um, Amnon, for some time there, was not punished for his sin, his crime against his sister. And in Absalom's mind, you know, this is this is terrible. This is wrong, and it was. It was. Amnon should have been dealt with. But again, it's not Absalom's place to step in and take his brother's life because of this sin, all right? And sometimes life isn't fair. And I think children, especially young people, have this, um, this radar of hypocrisy. You know, like, they're not in a position of leadership. They've never really experienced it. They, they don't have to make many decisions. And so it's easy for them to sit back and say, well, you should do this, and you should do that. And uh, my parents, they, that was a dumb decision, and I wouldn't agree with them on this thing or that thing. Well, I mean, I remember as a teenager, so I was pretty stupid too. <laughs> it's like, you, you know, you, you just have this tendency to, to nitpick uh, your parents' lives or, or, or leadership's lives. And we need to remember that Again, people are human. Leaders are human. And life isn't fair. So sometimes, and you better be thankful that life isn't fair sometimes because that same uh, mercy that you're complaining that somebody else received, whether uh, good or bad, uh, again, I guess mercy isn't ever really earned, but you better be thankful that there's people that have mercy in your life because if we want every single thing to be punished and dealt with, 
then that needs to be in my life too. And I don't know that I like that. Corey? Right. 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 <clears throat> yeah, and that's the, I think that is a big problem in uh, fundamentalism in in sort of through the years is that there's a lot of people who are standing for the right things with the wrong attitude and with the wrong intent. I mean, I've I've heard preachers say, you know. Uh, from the pulpit. I mean, I've heard people say, pastors say that their goal is to preach certain people out of the church. And it's like, I mean, okay, I, I get that if you preach the Bible, it's going to happen. You're going, you know, you can't keep everybody happy. And people are going to leave because the Bible is offensive. The truth is offensive. Uh, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, offended people with the truth. But was Christ's goal ever to drive people away from himself? No. And so I think there is, there's a lot of people who, uh, whether a pastor or layman who confront sin, which is the right thing to do, but with the wrong attitude, which makes it wrong. Um, their goal is to, you know, be spiteful or, or, or they're bitter about something or they want to hurt someone. Um, and I think it's important, uh, when the Bible says that you should consider yourself, uh, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So it needs to happen, but with the right motive, with the goal to seeing someone restored and somebody grow. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not always going to understand uh, until someone and you yourself are in that position of leadership, you don't comprehend all that uh, the responsibility and the and the thoughts that that are involved in making decisions. And Absalom here, uh, he failed to realize that you know leadership is human; they fail. He failed to realize that life's not fair sometimes. Get over it. I mean, yes, Amnon should have been punished. Was it Absalom's position to do it? No. Um, you know, maybe he could have gone to his father and. Talk about it. Like, Dad, you know what happened here. You know that you're upset about it. And I love my brother Amnon, which obviously he didn't. But if he had a right heart, it could have been dealt with in the right way. Instead of, he did that, I'm going to kill him. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, we need to be thankful for mercy. Thankful for mercy in our lives. Uh, because... Again, if somebody else receives mercy, we may agree with it, we may not, but we need to remember that there's times in our lives where we need mercy, and we have received mercy. Jesus Christ is merciful. So uh, remember a couple of these things. Then another is that Absalom failed to allow the proper authority to decide on the punishment and then just, you know, let it go. He, <laughs> Again, these are all these are all intertwined here or overlapping lessons, but let the proper authority deal with the issue. Let the parents deal with the issue. Uh, as kids, you know, you always want to be the, especially, you know, the oldest. It's like, I want to make sure all my brothers and sisters are in line. Um, we need to be careful. I mean, kids learn that as they grow. Uh, it's laughable when they're children. You know, it's like, Daisy. Leave Willow alone. Like, you know, it's like, she's okay, you know, and Willow's like, don't touch me. And it's like, <gasps> but the truth is that a lot of times we adults can be that way. We want to, you know, step in and take charge of everybody's life and be the, you know, the police, so to speak, whether in the church or uh, in our families or, or in the community, whether it's just, just like, we need to let the property, proper authority deal with the problem. And there's just times where, you know, I haven't been given the responsibility to lead this country. And I don't agree with 
the policies that are being made and, and, and President Biden's decisions or the Congress. I, I don't agree with that, but it's, it's not my authority to step in and say, you know, that's it. I'm killing him. Assassinate that president. It's, the, it's not right. All right. And so we may agree or disagree with certain things, but not my responsibility to set in, uh, step in and, and make things right, so to speak. And again, don't, we're not talking, especially in the, the role of um, pastors, we're not condoning overlooking sin, a major sin problem. But just understand that, you know, if Pastor Bickford chooses so-and-so to, you know, be in charge of this ministry, and we look at so-and-so's life and think, well, they're unfaithful in this way, or they're not the greatest example in this manner. Well, okay, like, that's a pastor's decision, not mine. You know, what am I going to do, grow bitter about it, cause problems, Absalom's case, kill him? I mean, just be willing to step back. You know, I'm not the end all to every decision in life. I'm not the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in charge of everybody's lives, every, every, every instance, okay? Another thing we can learn is the most foolish reaction to these perceived injustices is bitterness. And this, again, Absalom here just, he lets this fester. He lets this bother him. He lets this uh, just grow in his life. And the Bible teaches that we're to put away bitterness. We're to put away uh, anger. And Absalom did not do that. And it's, it's foolish because... The person who is bitter is the one that's most affected by it. There's been times, there's been times in my life, or you know, I've seen in people's lives where you find out, oh, so and so's been bitter at so and so for years and years and years. I've heard, <laughs> oh, it cracks me up. Story one time about uh, this woman who um, noticed that her relationship with her mother was not like, like she, she could just tell. And I mean, these people are, you know, the mother's 40, the grandmother's, uh, you know, 60 ish. And these people could tell th this woman could tell that her relationship with her mother, there was something there. Something wasn't right. Like something had changed her and she's talking with her. And finally she asks one day, she says, you know, what is bothering you? What is wrong? And uh, I think she asked her father, actually. The woman asked her father, like, is there something going on between me and mom that I don't know about? And the uh, father says, well, um, yeah, uh, she's, you know, she's been upset for years about that time when your oldest child was born and you were in the hospital. And the mother's like, you talking about what are you talking about you know this is 20 years after my oldest child's born what and so the dad says well you should talk to her about it well the mother talks to her mother and well you remember when you said all those years ago that when i was in the hospital i i said Oh, let me see my little baby boy. Let me hold my little baby boy. You know, the grandmother said this. And the mother says, that's not your little baby boy. You can hold him, but that's not your little baby. And for 20-some years, she was bitter because you said it wasn't my little baby boy. <laughs> and the mother's like, because it wasn't. <laughs> like, you were mad about that? Didn't affect the mother at all for some however many years, like, didn't affect her at all, but the person that's bitter, it's eating at them, it's grating them, it's just on their heart, on their mind, you know, it affects relationship. And it's so stupid. It's so stupid. And I know that there's bigger issues in life than being told that your grandson's not your, you know, little baby boy. But <laughs> uh, it still doesn't warrant bitterness, no matter the situation. And Absalom uh, obviously did not learn that. Uh, we need to let God be the um, avenger, uh, so to speak. The Bible says, uh, Romans chapter 12, 
verse 19, I believe. Uh, vengeance is mine, not vengeance is fine. Bummer. <laughs> vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. All right, God keeps track of these things. We need to rest in the fact that God keeps the books, so to speak. God sees everything, and that's a great comfort because, to be honest, you know, things that are going on in the Middle East, uh, uh, the Islam, Islamic terrorists, uh, people that are, things that are going on with Russia, you know, Putin taking over, right or wrong, what, God knows. God's keeping track. And you think people are getting away with things. No, they're not. No, they're not. Um, you know, they're forcing this, you know, vaccine and they're, you know, injuring people or whatever it is. You know, this coronavirus was created. Oh, what am I going to do about it? God controls things. God, can, God keeps track of this stuff. People aren't getting away with things. Uh, in the end, God will hold them accountable for their actions. And we need to rest in that. Uh, there's no sense in growing bitter over it. You know, there's people that um, believe that, you know, some of this stuff is all purposeful and wouldn't shock me in the slightest. But what good is it going to do if they get bitter at the government or bitter at China because, you know, my dad died or my grandfather died. And if this was purposeful, you know, that was totally unnecessary. Well, <laughs> Truth is, God knew when your father, grandfather, whoever it was, was born the day he would die. And it wouldn't have happened if God didn't allow it. Let God keep track. No sense in becoming bitter. All right? And a leader's shortcomings. A leader's shortcomings should never be used as an excuse for rebellion. Um, David or Absalom here, he looks at his dad and perceives these injustices that were allowed to take place. He... he uh, sees, you know, Amnon wasn't taken care of. Well, pff, neither was Absalom. And Absalom, instead of being thankful that his dad didn't kill him for the murder of his brother, lets this bitterness grow, and he, he turns rebellious against his father, and he desires to take his father's kingdom from him. And as children grow into maturity, you know, uh, there, there's going to be more and more leadership positions that uh, come their way. And they're not going to always get it right either. So as a young person, uh, remember that you're going to be an imperfect leader someday too. You're going to be an imperfect parent. You're going to be an imperfect teacher. You're going to be an imperfect boss. Whatever it is, you're going to make mistakes. And so remember that because there's a biblical principle there. You reap what you sow. And if you remember back earlier in David's life when um, he did not lift his hand against Saul. Uh, I think it was Corey brought up that when his, um, his men, after David's faith fails, he flees to the Philistines' land and his Ziklag, and his Ziklag is burned, his men, turn, his men speak of stoning him. And if David would have set the precedent that I can reach forth my hand to touch God's man, I can, I can take Saul's life, if he would have set that precedent what might have happened in that situation? We don't know. You can speculate all day long. But the point is, David was an imperfect leader, just like Saul was an imperfect leader. And it wasn't David's position to step in and kill King Saul because he was imperfect. And it wasn't David's men's position to step in and kill King David because he was imperfect. All right? Realize that your parents aren't perfect, your teachers aren't perfect, but someday you might be in those positions. And you're not going to be perfect either. And you're going to need the mercy and the forgiveness of those who you are in charge of. Uh, you're going to need your children to be understanding that you are a flawed individual. All right? The Bible doesn't teach children to obey their parents only if they're perfect. Um, they're not going to be. All right? Two wrongs never make a right. You know, and in, in this particular story with Absalom, he rebels, okay? And yes, what David did was wrong, not dealing with this situation. But to turn to rebellion, which the Bible says is as the sin of witchcraft, that's a pretty strong statement, you think about it. You know, we get used to these things in the Bible, but... It's a strong statement. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, God says to Saul. 
when he turns against, when he, when he steps out of line and, and steps into the, the, um, the role of the priest. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, you see these, uh, a video of, uh, or hear stories of these, these witch doctors, you know, in darkest Africa or, you know, uh, these islands. And you think, that's unbelievable. That's so, like so terribly wicked. You know, people praying and, and you know, using voodoo dolls and uh, doing miracles through Satan. It's like, that's unreal. And God says, it's like rebellion. It's like rebellion. It's a satanic foothold in your life. You're going to rebel against the authorities that I've set in your life, whether church or parental or, uh, you know, God himself. It's like witchcraft. It's just... It's comparable to, uh, you know, black magic, Satan worship. All right? We need to learn to respond to the failures of leadership with understanding, acceptance, uh, forgiveness, mercy. Um, again, never, never condoning sin. Never, um, you know, saying, well, leadership did that, so it must be okay. No. Learn and, and, and you know, Watch people, learn from them, but at the same time, be understanding that they're sinners just like us. And Absalom uh, did not do that. He, he, it's like he took every failure in his dad's life and used, his, used it as an excuse to uh, do what he wanted, fulfill his fleshly desires, to kill his brother, to take the kingdom from his dad, to turn the hearts of the people away from David, and just... Um, very sad, sad life, you know. And God judged Absalom for it. You know, when we know how Absalom's life ended, and it wasn't a pretty sight. Um, not that, you know, <laughs> I'm terrible. I just picture things run through my brain. Not that I, you know, it's, it's glorious that Absalom died in the way he did, but sometimes I think it'd be pretty interesting to see how, how that actually happened. You know, Absalom riding along on his mule, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, in the oak tree, like, there goes the mule, and there's Absalom hanging from the tree. It's like out of a cartoon or something, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but God judges Absalom for his sin, and you know, God was keeping track of David's decisions. God was keeping track of uh, David's failures, and he would have kept held David accountable. But Absalom didn't give it time. Absalom didn't uh, have patience. He, he didn't submit to the proper authorities, and he turns rebellious. He turns murderous, and really pretty sad. Um, but interesting that all these things happen. All these things take place after David's Sin with Bathsheba. And it's like, sin has consequences. Just long term, long term, sin has consequences. And uh, pretty sad, pretty sad story. But what David did wrong never justified what Absalom did wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. They never do. They never will. And so just some lessons there. I, I feel like. I, I can't stand when we don't look at much uh, Bible, but we, like I said, we had gone over this whole story a couple weeks ago and uh, just wanted to give some lessons that we could learn from Absalom's life. So, anything else? Be understanding of failed leadership, rotten Sunday school teachers. <laughs> Like me. All right, let's pray. 